Hello and welcome back to Guillotined 18th Century Chemist Theater, and we are about to wrap up our very long unit on bonding, mainly focusing on covalent bonding and all the ramifications of that. Uh, last time we talked about two types of intermolecular forces, the London dispersion force and the dipole-dipole force. Um, and today what we're going to do is talk about, mainly focus on a subspecies of the dipole-dipole force, and that's called the hydrogen bond. And really the reason you're alive today is because of hydrogen bonds. And so to quickly review, um, we talked about the idea of London dispersion forces or London forces. These are the default intermolecular forces. Uh, anybody can have a London dispersion force, whether you're polar or nonpolar. So it's usually this is overwhelmed um, uh, by any other type of intermolecular force. And so what you have are weak, temporary, flickering attractions as the cloud shifts around. Um, and so you can see there are some examples that kind of flickering back and forth. Um, now that's, that's not a very strong force, uh, usually no more than 4 kilojoules per mole. And you'll see that's absolutely uh, overwhelmed uh, when it comes to stronger bonds. But it's a start, you know, it's something that happens and that tends to increase with increasing sizes. On the other hand, polar molecules, since they have an, uh, an unequal distribution of charge can have stronger intermolecular forces due to the fact that you have this permanent um, dipole. And so you're going to look at an intermolecular force which is much stronger, um, almost, almost an order of magnitude greater at times. Um, again, so that's, that's pretty nice. Uh, and, and if you're going to compare stuff, ionic bonds, you'll see that again, just look at the comparison. Um, you're looking at uh, orders of magnitude greater, not just an order, but many orders of magnitude greater. Ionic bonds, remember that you have the crystal lattices, so that gives you that slightly higher strength than, than just a covalent bond. But even a covalent bond is much, 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 much stronger uh, than anything you're going to see in terms of intermolecular forces. I threw metallic solids in there for fun. Um, you know, I didn't bring this up last time, but technically intermolecular forces can happen within a molecule if it's big enough. And you'll see a lot of this in proteins and other types of biological compounds, um, and that actually causes some of the structure of the, I think it's called the quaternary structure, of how these things wrap around and interact with themselves. And so, although in first year chemistry we talk about intermolecular forces between molecules, um, just remember that if a molecule is big enough, it can certainly have uh, intermolecular forces uh, with different parts of its own self. So something to think about. And so again, now the dipole-dipole force, so the dipole force is dealing with, a, with partially positive and partially negative parts of molecules interacting with each other on a permanent basis. Um, and, and a strong subspecies of the dipole force is something called the hydrogen bond. And again, it's one of the, another one of those unfortunate names because when you see the word bond, you tend to think of a chemical bond. But this is just another intermolecular force. Um, now, but, but there are some special qualifiers here that you are going to need hydrogen in one of the molecules um, and, and you're going to need that bonded to a strongly electronegative element, specifically fluorine, nitrogen, or, and oxygen. If you don't have hydrogen bonded to one of those three elements, then you really aren't going to set up the situation to have a strong dipole force called the hydrogen bond. And let's, let's show you why. So water is our classic example of this. Um, now again, due to the geometry of water, uh, you're going to have a partially positive and a partially negative part of the molecule. Uh, the highly electronegative oxygen is going to pull the electrons away from hydrogen and the geometry is going to allow you to set that up. Now you'll see that a lot, but what makes this a little different is the fact that when you pull a cloud away from hydrogen, if you think about it, there's really nothing underneath but the proton. So what you're going to get, although you're still it's only going to be partially positive and partially negative, they're going to be very strong partially positive and partially negative. So it sounds sort of like an oxymoron, but they're very strong partial charges. <laughs> because again, you're going to pull that cloud away and reveal that proton underneath that hydrogen. So this, what, this is why it's like a super dipole force. It's still a dipole force, but it's a super dipole force. Um, and that creates a very, very strong uh, interaction between those. Again, it's still weak compared to chemical bonds, but compared to the other intermolecular forces that we just talked about, it's very, very strong. 10 to 40 is much stronger. And so why, do we, why should we care about hydrogen bonds? Well, really, uh, you know, when, when you get up in the morning, you can really thank your lucky stars that we have hydrogen bonds. And there's a couple reasons why. Um, if it wasn't for hydrogen bonds, uh, liquid uh, water wouldn't exist on planet Earth. It would be a gas. Um, water is a very, very small molecule, and if you think of other similar small molecules, they're all gases. Uh, and water would technically boil about 50 below zero. 
and it's Celsius. Um, that would not be good for us. We would never see liquid water on the planet Earth um, unless you went to very cold places, 50 below. But it wouldn't matter because all the water in your body uh, would turn to gas and we wouldn't exist anyway. So if it wasn't for hydrogen bonds, water wouldn't be a liquid at room temperature. That's a pretty big deal. Um, now, not, not maybe not end of the world, uh, but uh, if it wasn't for hydrogen bonds, uh, ice wouldn't float. Uh, when, when those water molecules align, uh, ice actually becomes less dense, and that's because those water molecules lock into a certain type of lattice that is actually less dense. They're a little bit more spread apart than just water molecules rolling off of each other. Now, there's different types of ice. Um, uh, in fact, uh, Kurt Vonnegut played off this idea with uh, Cat's Cradle and, and created something called Ice Nine, which in the fictional story was an ice that, um, when it froze, uh, remained, remained frozen into uh, much higher temperatures. And it ended up, of course, being a, a big disaster in that in that story. But if ice didn't float, uh, you know, it might not be the end of life on Earth. But uh, think about it, uh, that any all aquatic life would be very different because lakes would freeze from the bottom up. And so, uh, aqua you know, freshwater life would be very, very different. And, uh, you know, we wouldn't necessarily have the same kind of life forms in there. And plus, icebergs would then sink. And so if icebergs sunk, uh, then the Titanic would not have sunk. And hence, Leonardo DiCaprio would have never got his breakthrough role back in Titanic in the 90s. So Leonardo DiCaprio can thank his uh, stardom to intermolecular forces of water. Unless, of course, the Titanic took place in a submarine, but that's a different story. And then finally, uh, the very DNA uh, of, of life itself is, is due to hydrogen bonds. I mean, think about it. The, the two strands of DNA need to be able to separate, se separate and then come back together. And we don't want to have to break chemical bonds for that. And so the much weaker physical interaction of a hydrogen force is broken. And therefore, uh, DNA can be split apart pretty easily and put back together very easily. So that's pretty cool. So I, thought, I hope you thought that was interesting. Uh, we did focus a little bit more on hydrogen bonds, but I think they are ve definitely the most interesting intermolecular force. And so that wraps up our unit on, on bonding. And, and so really what you should be able to do by the end of this unit is take something, take, take a formula, make a two-dimensional model of it, uh, blow that up into a three-dimensional model of it, talk about the polarity of said molecule, and then from the polarity, talk about the intermolecular forces available. Um, so if you can do that from all the lessons we've talked about, you're in great shape. So thanks for watching and have a great day.